please welcome to the Leon Loft, Sharon Van Etten. Thank you very much. Is this on? Well, all right, there we go. Yes, it is. Um, there are so many areas to, to get into, limited time here. So why don't we just start with the sounds that people are going to hear uh, on Remind Me Tomorrow. Um, keyboards and synthesizers, some of which you brought here, and a different sound. Well, you know, I feel like I, during the time I was writing the record, I was also writing a score, um, which was my friend Catherine Diekman, who asked me to write the score, referenced Ry Cooter's score for the film Paris, Texas, and that's very guitar-driven. And every time I felt like I got to a dead end in the writing process, I would put down the guitar and I would pick up any other instrument, and I gravitated towards synthesizers and keyboards just to clear my head, not realizing I was writing songs. But it changed the whole <laughs> thing. But it changed the whole dynamic. I mean, so. Uh, I happen to note that a 70s era Roland keyboard <laughs> synthesizer. The Jupiter 4, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that uh, was a big one. Was, uh, you know, and this is a sound that would be very familiar to some of us of a certain vintage from the 70s and 80s. <laughs> um, but you hear things, different ideas uh, come out of your head when you hear different sounds, clearly. So I guess I was wondering about how that started to affect your writing process, if it was something you even actually noted. Well... Number one, I feel like I sang in a different key, which drew out different kinds of nuances in my voice, like how low I can go, how high I can go, how much reverb I use. And I was experimenting with a loop pedal, and I would plug in keys to my guitar pedals and tweak the sound there with delay and distortion and 
do the things that anyone that would be a purist with the synthesizers might not agree with, but <laughs> it helped me look at it as a new instrument, and I had no one around me to judge me while I was figuring it out. <laughs> that's important, right? <laughs> I mean, that, that's a good way to get to uh, something truly different, is just to be you and yourself. Exactly, just alone in a room with my thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> it's <laughs> to be also, dangerous, too. It's a dark-sounding <clears throat> record, but thematically, maybe less dark. So that's, that's kind of a nice uh, mismatch between where you're going with the lyrics, in this case, and the sound, an ominous, <laughs> dark sound. I was in a really good place. I still am. And I, I think I struggle with being in a good place, knowing what's going on in the out in the in the real world, but knowing that in my little bubble, I like the safety and the warmth and my home and domesticity and my love for my partner and my child and my career is doing well, but I also know the reality of what's going on everywhere else. And I wanted to acknowledge that a little bit in the production of the record, that even in this little haven, there's still all this darkness, but I still want to keep it safe. Yeah, yeah. What do you want to do next? <clears throat> no one's easy to love.
Uh, you are listening to Ann Arbor's 1071. We are here live at the Leon Loft, recording our session here with Sharon Van Etten, uh, who, by the way, will be playing a show tomorrow night at the Majestic in Detroit. So be aware of that uh, if you are interested. And Sharon, if you could, uh, you guys sound fantastic. Uh, could you introduce your band for us? I would love to. Heather Woods Broderick is on keys and vocals. <laughs> Jorge Balbi is on the drum machine. <laughs> and Charlie Damsky is on the keys and vocals over here. And thank you all again for coming. Um, let's talk a bit about this time between that I was talking about, the time between uh, Are We There and uh, Remind Me Tomorrow. I want to stress this was not a break from music. It maybe was a break from doing music, put big quotes around it, doing music. In other <laughs> words, you know, writing, then get into the studio, record something, get out on tour, yeah. do that cycle. Um, and what I, was, what I was curious about was if you could put yourself in the place, like the first few weeks after you decided that it was time to pursue some other things, to pursue a life, the feeling of those first few weeks of not being on this uh, cycle that you had been on. I think I was sleeping a lot of the time at first. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you get, I think a lot of musicians get caught up in that cycle of making the record, going on tour, coming back home, writing, recording, and it's easy, it's easy to get lost in that. And I think the content of my last record was so intense for me that after a while I was going to a dark place and I wasn't appreciating the things that came with that and the success that that record received which I feel very grateful for but I just I was in a place where I realized that I wanted to be home and I wanted to nurture my relationship I wanted to live I've been living in New York almost 15 years and I finally am able to afford to live there and I'm just not there yeah, right. <laughs> so I thought well why don't I just take time off figure out how to be creative while being home and as soon as I opened that door of opportunity I feel like people started knocking and Again, I feel very fortunate that as soon as I got off the road, I got asked to do some co-writing with young songwriters trying to find their voice, and I got asked to do a score for my friend Catherine's film, Catherine Diekman's film, Strange Weather, starring Holly Hunter, and I got asked to act in a Netflix show called The OA, and I, I don't think, if I was on tour, I would have said no to all that. Right. You would have had to. <laughs> I had to, yeah. yeah. So I feel, <clears throat> I feel very grateful for those things. <laughs> when you when you were in that sleepy period, I mean, did, was there a long mental to do list, or was it really just the feeling of freedom to now kind of see what what came your way, what kind of settled in? Well, honestly, my main goal outside of being creative was to go back to school to pursue psychology. We're going to get to that. <laughs> but <laughs> I really, I just, I didn't have a plan. I just knew that I needed a break and I needed space. And I, I had a studio apartment and I just, I was trying to learn how to live a normal life for a minute. Yeah. Was that hard? Because I mean, that can be, you had, it's not a normal life. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's definitely not a normal right. life. I don't know who I'm kidding when I say that, but. Yeah, but it's, it's a challenge. Yeah, but it's like like anything. I think you have, you just you go through the day one step at a time, and you just do it. And the more you look back in your past, the more nostalgic and depressed you can get. The more too far ahead you get, the more anxiety you get. And so, the more present I am, the the happier I am. And I try to. I try to live like that. You mentioned school. Uh, right at the beginning of this year, <clears throat> first couple of days of January, you posted something on your Instagram, which I thought was hysterical. It was your transcript, right? <laughs> was that your final term? I, yeah, I, 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 got, I got three A's. <laughs> I was only, I'm only going part-time, and uh, one of those classes was music, so take that with a grain of salt, but... I learned a lot, and I, I can only go part time right now because of all the other things going on in my life. But I'm—I never got my undergrad, so I have a ways to go. But 
It's a good feeling. Yeah, no, and I noted the psychology course, the two psychology courses along with that music, and the fact that you did much better than I did. That was my degree. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> so congratulations on that. That's Thanks. why I'm doing this, is because of that. You get it, you're understanding people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, well, no, actually, <laughs> because of the failure of that to uh, actually succeed. Um, but I, I did read that you are actually looking at this as something for down the road, that that might be a thing to pursue. Um, counseling, I think, is what you mentioned. Yeah, Brooklyn College has a mental health counseling program that's really progressive, and I I met the head of the psychology department there, and he's really understanding of my unpredictable lifestyle, and he's just thrilled that I'm trying. <laughs> <clears throat> like two weeks into school, I got asked to audition for the OA, had to defer my enrollment to the following semester, and he just said, just promise me you'll come back. And then I went back the next semester. I was pregnant. He didn't see me until the end of the semester, and I had to go and tell him I wasn't coming back next semester because I was pregnant. He was like, just promise me you'll come back. <laughs> it's always something with me, I guess. Uh, what would you like to do next? Um, how about 17? How about it?
Thank you again. Thank you all. Um, we are going back to the station now, and we are continuing on here at the Leon Loft with Sharon Van Etten. A new album is called Remind Me Tomorrow. It has just been out a few weeks. Sharon is playing tomorrow at the Majestic in Detroit with Nilifer Yanya opening up. Get there early, and you will not be disappointed. She's amazing. She really is fantastic. Yeah. Uh, you can catch the full interview we're doing today on Acoustic Cafe in a couple of weeks, and we have been brought to you today by Sessie Mazda. And now it's back to more music on Ann Arbor's 107.1. We out? Jeez, I did it again. Sorry. Did that go over the air? <laughs> Whatever. I just never get this right. So I always go, right? right. <laughs> Do it non-verbally, and it would be fine. <laughs> All right. Um, so, your son. Uh, approaching two, is that right? Yeah, I'll be two in March. That's fantastic. And as I understand it, this is actually this leg right now. What you're doing right now is the first time you've actually had yeah, time away. My first tour without my first tour with having a kid and I said goodbye to him in New York a couple of days ago. <laughs> yeah. OK. And, and we're going to stay away from the whole. Yeah, we're going <laughs> to. He's gonna... in daycare right now and they send me photos every day and he's having so much fun. And so I feel <laughs> I feel good about that. He's had a music class yesterday. He was singing. He was laughing. And right now he's not sleeping and he's hanging out with his dad all night and watching basketball. He's fine. <laughs> right. So don't feel that for Clem. All right. <laughs> you don't have to. Um, but, it, you know, it does bring up that whole. That whole thing, which actually I don't want to talk about. We're not going to talk about the touring parent thing. I don't want to do that. Instead, what I want to ask you about is as somebody, as a writer who has often written about the darker themes involved with love, suddenly you're confronted with this unconditional situation, unconditional love, this nurturing uh, part of life that has to happen, mm -hmm. right? Um, it has to change your worldview. I would think, um, and change. It's different than two adults trying to work something out. <laughs> yeah, because it's not about you. Right. You know, it's and you're staring at this human being that you made that is the sum of your love that you know you're going to put everything into to one day just leave you. <laughs> and, you know, you want them to find the things they love. You want them to find it their own way. And in your head, you think you know best. And I, the older I get, the more I apologize to my parents for what I had done to them over the years. But it's, it's scary. You know, it's scary to know that I'm responsible for a human being. But, um, but deeper than that, just I want them to be OK. Mm -hmm. I want them to feel safe. I want them to feel loved. And I want to be as present as I can. And I want him to constantly see me and my partner trying to figure it out, even mm. if it's not, even if we're not perfect. You mm. know, we make mistakes along the way and we'll struggle, but I want him to see that struggle too. And just things I'm still learning that I want him to see. Yeah, but it's a different type of interaction. It's like, it's, it's fun. I mean, at the same time, it's also fun. It's very challenging, but it's also you know, it's, it's a ton of fun. so much fun. <laughs> He's so much fun. He loves life. He loves music. And he loves people. And I just see it in him. Like, it's not something that we instilled in him. It's something that he naturally exudes. And um, he obviously is from us, but he found it on his own. Mm. So. Does he have a musical favorite kind of thing? Well, he gravitates towards the piano at home. I only have an acoustic guitar, piano, and drumsticks. He's been using a xylophone as a skateboard. <laughs> and um yeah but he he has and he loves basketball he has a we have a hoop taped to the door and everything's a ball <laughs> oh sure oh yeah <laughs> uh you mentioned uh the acting piece uh on the oa the recurring character um also your van appeared in twin peaks season three <laughs> gotta love that right okay um Be wild uh the, the acting part here, and something that I, I would think you're having a good time with and perhaps would pursue more, um, just again got me thinking about uh, writing and performing in that you have to perform just like you're performing your songs and have been for 15 years. You know, but these aren't your words. 
you have to give a convincing performance. This is not, you didn't write this. Exactly. I don't. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, I don't think I have it figured out, but I was drawn to the role because it, there were parallels in the character's backstory to my own life. And she grew up in choir. She ran away from home to pursue music. And she something terrible happens to her on the way. And her voice becomes her superpower. <laughs> I mean, that didn't exactly happen to me. But <laughs> I do think my voice is my superpower. And um, it got me through a lot in my life. And... So I, for the role, I, I draw from a lot of personal experience to to exude a mood uh, in the show. But I don't, I don't know how to act, though. I actually, sometimes I draw from too much personal experience that I think I'm in a darker place than I should be. <laughs> um, but I would love to take more acting classes and improv and learn how to be more on my toes and instead of living in it too long and... I've learned how to use it for shows because I feel like it's nice to kind of feel like you're dressing up, going to work, getting in a different kind of character, even if it's just a different version of myself. Like, I can feel like I'm getting in a different headspace than, you know, crawling out of my sweatpants and just putting <laughs> on a pair of nice jeans or something. Right. Well, and I was going to ask you also about that, just that music is, a, it can be a, a solitary task that you, go, you can actually do what you're doing anywhere. Truth be told, you could just walk out on the street and start doing that. You can't make a not movie. Not today, it's really Not cool. today. You know, <laughs> today's a little challenging. But most, you, you can't go and make a movie all by yourself. Yeah, I mean, well, I guess you can. But I mean, the kinds of things that you have been involved in, these require lots of people. Like, it's a, it's a huge moving beast. Yeah. Um, which is sometimes different and sometimes challenging for people who come from a real DIY mm, career path. Right. Um, I would say that as I've developed my career that I've grown amazing people around me that I wouldn't be able to do what I do without them from my band to my label to my management to my booking agents, my publicist to my like publisher. I mean, there's so many people, um, I would say 30, 40 people on my team making it happen, and that doesn't count the venues and the radio stations uh, that have supported me all along the way. And um, so in that sense, I feel like I, I, I understand working as a team. But my first day on set, it was about 200 people waiting around <laughs> in one room at the same time. <laughs> and you have to be efficient. And you have to get it. You have to get the task done in a specific day because they plan everything out. Even if it's super last minute, even if I didn't know until the week before that I got the gig, I knew that I'd have to show up every day, and we would shoot until we got it done. And it it was a very intense experience. Yeah. Um, what would you like to do next? We're gonna do a song called Hands.
thank you all again. Um, by the way, for the people who are here in this room, you may not have noticed on your way in, uh, but there is a whole bunch of stuff out there, which you really should take a look at. Some great, look. well, first of all, there's vinyl, which is awesome. <laughs> uh, you can find the album on vinyl. You can also, which has a lovely full-size vinyl of this cover. And then um, there's also CDs and shirts and hats and stuff, so take a peek when you're uh, on your way out. Um, as I mentioned uh, also early on that, Writing didn't really stop, and, and, and in fact, when you sort of came back into looking at what had accumulated, I saw there were like 50 songs <laughs> that were sitting around. Yes. I, <clears throat> you know, I, I write a lot out of therapy when I'm going through something, or I'm just learning an instrument, or I have an idea, and I never sit down to write a record. It's when I realize that I have a collection of ideas that make sense together that represent where I'm at in my life. I have a country record that I don't think the world needs right now. <laughs> <laughs> in my back pocket, I'm waiting on. And um, I have a piano ballads record that, again, I just, when I want to roll solo, maybe that's the album I'll release or something. <laughs> but it just, it felt, I had all these interesting songs with instrument like, difficult arrangements and I knew that we'd had fun figuring it out and I just I remember I sat next to my partner usually at the end of the night put the boy down we go to the farthest room in our apartment because our kid is in our closet right now it has a window <laughs> but we sit in the kitchen at the bar and we pour each other a glass of wine when we finally get him down and we listen to music and we talk about our day and I played him a song. He was like, that's really cool. Do you have another one like that? I'm like, yes. And I played him another one like that. <laughs> He's like, I like that one too. Like, do you have another one? And then I clicked on the folder and I opened it and he saw all the songs and he kind of put his hand on my knee and said, I think it's time for you to make a record. <laughs> and that was the fall of 2017. Yeah. <laughs> and you picked the Ted. Out of that folder. It took a minute. We yeah. we actually recorded uh, fifteen songs, mm. and then we you know choosing the ones that make the most sense together once the production has been decided. Like it's usually it's a struggle to let some go, but I know they won't ever disappear because I'll make it something else at some point. But yeah. a country record. What, so I'm, I'm curious. This group, whatever this group of songs <laughs> is that you're talking about, uh, what is it that identifies them to you as country song. Well, there's a little bit of swagger in there, like a little Lucinda Williams and like, you know, the, the dirgy acoustic songs where I'm like gritty. You know, even if it's just solo acoustic with like a, a nasty drum beat, I just, I want to make that record, but I just feel like I'm going to wait till my voice gets gnarlier. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> there's also actually a fascinating list of recommended artists to listen to inside uh, the liner notes on the album. Because I, I, when, when I saw Country Record, I also saw Chatham County Line as one of the, <laughs> one of the artists that you were recommending. I mean, there are many, many, many artists. But uh, it, it must be an interesting, interesting evening listening time. Yeah. yeah. There's, a lot of, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of good music in the listings. Um, my second record epic I made with the producer Brian McTeer from Philadelphia and he said that that was something he used to love to do and so we came up with a list together of all the musicians that had been a part of it and all the music we've been listening to that inspired the record and people have responded to that in a way that I, I wasn't expecting mm. and I've done it ever since and it's I don't know, I, f I find it very comforting. I like knowing what artists I like are listening to and who they're associated with. And sometimes I'm like, I, there's so much that I can't even fit it all in there. And I forget I put, you know, I, I, I'm afraid I'll forget someone on the list. And I think I even put Tiny Ruins in there twice by accident. Right, yes. right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there's, there's so many, there's so much good music out there right now. You, um, all right, so you've had this, this time to have a life, <laughs> and and it's an ongoing thing. And, I, and in fact, you know, children, things like that, uh, new facets to a career, uh, all of that is ongoing. Which I was thinking gives you a lot 
to write about. Like there are now lots of observations that maybe you didn't have when you were just doing the cycle and you were doing a set of songs, recording them, taking them out on tour, repeating them every night, uh, having to live through them every night, some of them. Um, and you have a lot to write about, but maybe not just songs, like prose. And now you've been involved with uh, the world of screenwriting and that kind of thing. I guess I'm just curious if other types of writing are now bubbling up. You know, I got to spend six months in Los Angeles being on call to, to shoot the OA, the second season. And um, I only shot eight days. And I, I, don't, I don't get bored easily, but I know that I need to find things to do or I'll go crazy. Whether it be reading, writing, walking, hiking, thinking. But um, I befriended my, my, one of my, ba well, I've befriended all my babysitters, but, you know, they become a part of your family, <laughs> you know. It's kind of a, it's one of the craziest relationships I've ever had. It's very new to me as an adult. And, you know, when I first started working with a babysitter, you're kind of admitting to yourself, like, you probably have more experience than me. And I'm about to leave a stranger alone with my kid who has way more experience caretaking, you know. I was a babysitter when I was a teenager, and I, I don't even want, I'm so glad video cameras didn't exist back then. But um, I'm just kidding. But, but one, of our, one of my sitters is a writer and comedian, and she encouraged me to do stand-up at a variety show that she was putting on in Los Angeles. And she just saw something in me. She's like, you're just funny. We have a really good rapport. We make each other laugh. And, and I tried stand-up. And I don't, I don't think I want to be a comedian, but I'm interested in the writing aspect. I think it's one of the hardest jobs in entertainment to be on in that way all the time. I think at least with my music, it can be open to interpretation where with comedy, it's so specific and you have to live in the moment way more. But it's a whole other story. But she and I came up with this idea for a show, which is about a mother and all her relationships with her babysitters because there's some complexity there where it's they give you the freedom to leave the house. It's something that people don't really talk about. It's really isolating being a new mom. You know, the husband goes back to work and, or your, whatever, your partner goes back to work and you're left there with a child and you, that you, you, see, you feel so vulnerable. You don't know what the hell you're doing. I keep thinking like he's gonna stop breathing at any moment. And the heal, I had a C-section, so the healing process of all that was a whole other vulner, level of vulnerability and loneliness. And all of a sudden, this angel arrives and says, go, take a shower. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I pulled in like the bassinet to the shower, into the bathroom just to like have the longest shower ever. And I took a shower until he would wake up. It would be amazing. But to leave the house, to start to work again, to find that new version of your life again. It's babysitters. <laughs> but that's a show. That's a show. That's a great idea for a show. Thanks. Get writing. Well, I know. <laughs> you're not on my downtime. <laughs> <laughs> All right, listen, this has uh, just been wonderful to talk to you. Um, we have time for one more. What do you want to do? Uh, we're going to do a song called Stay. Excellent.
Thank you. Sharon Van Etten. And many thanks to Heather, Jorge, Charlie. Thank you so much. Thank you. John Bomarito back there. Thank you. Jeff back here. Misty taking pictures. Charlie taking pictures. And Leon speakers. Thank you all.